And you can hear me okay? Yeah, we, I can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, you may begin. Good, thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, good morning all. Nice to not really see you. Um, it is, this was originally intended to work seamlessly with the presentation of the well-earned fest shrift to Lawrence Kepi at the original incarnation of this um, of this meeting, because I had a paper in there discussing the topic I want to talk about today. So the paper is published, it's been familiar to some of you, but I think it's a story that merits um, presentation, because it tells us about the discoveries that lurk you know, unloved or unnoticed in museum stores. And this particular story, Started with what happens to many museums, a move of our stores, moving from the old customs house in Leith, a wonderful building, but totally unsuitable as a museum store, um, to move instead to the freshly built National Museum's Collection Centre at Granton on the north side of Edinburgh. This is wonderful, the material is now in a much better condition, um, but it also means you find things you didn't otherwise, hadn't previously known you had. And I put this in just as, um, roller racking pornography for, for store connoisseurs. And one of the real benefits is it makes you move everything and look at everything. One of the things I discovered in this move was a box I'd never previously noticed, labelled Alabaster Bowl from Grahamston Falkirk. And in fact, there were two boxes with that label, one of them with this bizarre um, layered um, lid like object, and the other one much more of a large bowl, 350 mil or so in diameter. We see it in two different yeah. Well, of course, for any museum creator, the first thing you do is you find the number and you chase off to the catalog. And the 1892 catalog of the museum describes a vase of alabaster, imperfect, found in railway cutting near Grahamston in 1849. And this gave a critical I was then able to go and speak to Jeff Bailey at Falkirk Museum, who knows his ways around the antiquarian byways of that area really well. And he turned up the Stirling Observer for 1850. So late July 1849, great quantities of relics of antiquity were found by the workmen at the Midland Railway, among which was a very fine alabaster arm containing a quantity of calcined bones. Unfortunately, the urn was broken. The lid was similar to inverted sugar bowls. This matches our description really nicely. And when we then trace the Midland Railway, we find the fine spot is not really Falkirk Grahamston, but Camelon, immediately beside it. Camelon um, was one of the major Roman forts in Scotland in both the Flavian and the Antine occupations. It sits just north of the Antine Wall on the obvious route north over the Forth heading up in Eastern Scotland. You can see also, let me risk the technology here, the railway blasting its way through the, the two forts. This is both the first and the second century fort here and a complicated series of annexes. And here we see the very railway today and the damage that it caused. The map bottom right gives you a sense of the wider complex. This wasn't just a fort, but a gathering ground, to use Gordon Maxwell's wonderful phrase. Um, temporary camps where troops would gather before going north for campaigns, the mustering of men for the northern wars. And the dark grey shaded area marks where the railway was cut, elsewhere it's in bank. So the most likely area for the discovery is through the heart of the fort and the area to the west. Outside the fort, exactly where we would expect um, a funeral, a, a burial ground. Early antiquarians were delighted with the find. Here we hear Daniel Wilson, secretary of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. It appears to have been a work of much beauty and had it been in a perfect condition, would have formed one of the most remarkable traces of Roman art hitherto brought to light in the vicinity of the Antonine Wall. So why did I not know about it? Well, in a museum, you're always building on the work of your predecessors. And one of the great predecessors in our museum was Joseph Anderson. 
He was the keeper for over 40 years and, as the picture probably indicates, a formidable character. Um, Anderson had a view on everything. And he viewed this alabaster urn. So let me He viewed this alabaster urn with some suspicion. The alabaster urn is now in the museum, but presents no features to suggest Roman workmanship. And with that, it was condemned to vanish into the stores for a hundred years. Now, Anderson, his view carried great clout at the time. He was a polymath, but he wasn't a Roman specialist. And in fact, we can find good Roman parallels for this very thing. Let's look at the object in a bit more detail. Here's two views of the bowl, 360 millimetres in diameter. You can see the wonderful ribbing running around it. And on the left image, it's the traces of a strap handle that once came up onto the shoulder. The surface is water-worn, but originally would have been spectacular. And we can see that with the other fragment as well. The, the so-called lid, the inverted sugar bowl, um, the flaring to one end, you can see the sides of it are rather worn, but if you look at the top and the bottom where it's protected, you get a much better idea of the original appearance of this wonderful honey-colored stone. And a look called alabaster, um, a passing geologist with a bottle of sulfuric acid um, discovered very, very carefully, mind you, that this was um, not alabaster calcium sulfate, but travertine calcium carbonate. The little knob on the top is a fitting, a fitting to connect it to the underside of the bowl. And originally, it would have looked something like this. Digital reconstruction, the two fragments don't actually fit together today, but this gives you some idea of quite how impressive it would once have looked like. And now we can recognize the parallels. This wonderfully intact example from the Via Laurentina in Rome gives you a sense of how it would, would once have looked. And critical to my research on this has been Simona Perna's um, PhD and other research on this topic. And I'm very grateful to her for a very useful discussion and references. So this was a spectacular urn, and the contexts of them make it clear these were funerary urns, created for holding the ashes after, after cremations. The Via Laurentina example that we see here um, was found in a columbarium just outside Rome with two other examples. And these are found in wealthy burials. The stone itself marks them out as wealthy because these stones are exotic. As I say, they're often called alabaster or calcareous alabaster, certainly our is more accurate than cavertine. Here, Barker and Perna's map of the sources emphasizes how they're found round about the Mediterranean. And it's not yet that easy to pinpoint where particular ones come from, but there are very strong arguments that these banded alabasters or these banded travertines are ancient. There are close visual links to the Egyptian sources. And we also know from the other stones being used from these arms, there are around a hundred or so in total from across the whole, from across the empire, this Egyptian stone that is prioritised above all. Porphyry, as we see in the centre here, from one end in Barth Notes, or basalt from the Cairo region, you see an example from London, from Warwick. Highly expensive and exotic stones. This added to the value, but Simona argues there was also a symbolic importance using Rome to using Egyptian stone, suitable for eternity, because of the Roman fascination with Egyptian ideas of the afterlife. Now there are benefits to having a broken stone a broken arm, which we can see how it's constructed rather best. And Alan Brady's drawing here shows our fragments reconstructed as part of an arm like the Via Laurentina one. And you can see the four different elements. The base, 
the bowl coming around to a narrow shoulder, and originally, as Fiorentina shows, a lid and a nail. And Simone argues these are all carved from a single block of stone, which makes sense if you hollow the interior out, you can use that for the, for the bait and the lid. He also points out that the finds from Rome and its hinterland show the maximum typological variety. And it's likely, it seems, that the blocks are quarried in Egypt, brought to Rome where the actual carving takes place, and then they are dispersed. Where are they dispersed to? Well, it's a very Mediterranean habit. Italy, the shores of the Adriatic, southern Gaul, North Africa in particular. And it's particularly of the first and into the second century, although these urns, because they're spectacular, continue to get used later on. Often, but not always, they come from spectacular tombs. Here we see from Tour de l'Or de la Loge, it takes on Provence, and before it's tragic destruction in the late 18th century, um, there was a series of grave goods found, including this wonderful porphyry arm. And the inscriptions also mark the, the residence of this tomb out as people who are locally highly socially important. Or we can look at this example from Montpellier, um, where the urn on the left um, was found with other grave goods, classic libation goods, a patera and a jug, um, also made from um, calcareous alabaster, again from a rich burial. Now, often, these are in grand monuments, but not always. There's two different strands, if you like, uh, uh, an extrovert and an introvert strand to burial at this period. Um, some of them are using the great big monuments and using the stone. Um, in other words, the stone itself is enough to mark this out as, as a burial of importance. And the associations, the grave goods, the inscriptions and so on, point out to these as being very much elite burials, the imperial family, the imperial household, the wealth. Our example clearly didn't come from a big grand monument because the navies would have spotted it. And the water-worn condition of the surface suggests that it was buried in a pit and without much protection. So the urn itself would have been a similar thing for the afterlife. The cremation presumably burnt the moment into the memory of the beholders, but there wasn't a great grand monument to go with. It is, however, vanishing layer in the northwest of the provinces. There are only two other examples. The one from London, from Warwick Square, with the Claudian date, which is Egyptian basalt, and one from Metz in northern Gaul. And ours is the first in the military zone. So why is it there? It speaks, surely, of a well-prepared traveller on the journey to the north. And in fact, there's a parallel, I'm not suggesting this is the body of Severus, I should hasten to add, but there's a parallel in Herodian's account um, of events after Severus's death in York in 211. He describes the body of Severus had been cremated and the ashes with perfumes consigned to an alabaster urn. It was then taken back to Rome. So we have powerful people moving through the frontier as part of the imperial adventures in this part of the world. And particularly at a gathering ground like Camelon, a big grand um, fort, and also thousands of troops massing for the advance, we could imagine a fort commander or an army leader or one of their household who comes to uh, an end there, but has come prepared, has brought their own with them, as Severus clearly did. And there are hints in other aspects of the Scottish funerary record of other spectacular burials, the pine cone from Inveresk, the wonderful lioness from Cramon, were once part of big grand funerary monuments. So it's not so unexpected to see this on the frontier. But what about a wider context? Well, if we look at imported stone vessels, um, Hilary Cool did a really useful paper a number of years ago looking at stone mortars, and she emphasised how most of these stone mortar traditions are regional, uh, of Cornwall or Kent or so on. And it's really only um, the Dorset tradition, Arabic marble and Kimmeridge shale, which see really widespread use across Roman Britain in mortars and basins. And these are relatively abundant, much rarer are the exotic stone mortars and basins. 
coming in mostly from the Mediterranean, from Egypt, not all province. We don't yet know, for example, where the stone used for this um, um, basin from well in North Yorkshire came from. But these fit in, it seems, the habit of importing spectacular stone, most likely in this case for the bathhouse or for, for bathing or personal grooming. They're rare. I wouldn't claim this map is um, anything like comprehensive, but it gives an idea with the black dots of where mortars and basins are coming from, mostly in the civilian zone in the south, with a scatter into the north. But also more personal items, the red dots. And by this, I mean the, the funerary urns, but also things like unguentaria, drinking cups and bowls and so on. And there are a number of striking examples of those. Let me pick out a couple of examples here. At the bottom right of the slide from Colton Park in Dorchester, the base of a schist bowl, unfortunately not province but not local. And actually much more striking from Caister and Sea, this steatite vessel, which is a style known on the continent as lavets, the materials known as lavets. It's a material coming from Switzerland or northern Italy and is more common in the Reichian frontier, suggesting here connections back into the, the continent, perhaps with an imported object, perhaps traveling with a soldier at the gate. Now the sharp eye will have noticed there are two dots in Scotland, but I've only talked about one find so far. Well, having found the, the Camelot urn, I was then inspired to do a flurry through the, the boxes and uncovered from Castle Cary, these two shares in a box labeled pot which they're clearly not. Two shares from two different vessels. Castle Cay is not, and it's one of the key wall forts. Own walls, big barracks, probably, probably housing a, a unit of a thousand soldiers. The kind of site where you might expect, therefore, to find prestige Roman finds, and again, we have the railway to thank of the purse, because the railway, if you go from Edinburgh to Glasgow, you blast your way through there too. In the debris from that work, these shares were found. Alan Braby's reconstruction here gives an idea of how they once looked. One of them comes from a shallow dish. The other, the arcading, looks initially, initially like a beaker, but if you look at the rim molding, it looks to be lipped. It looks like it's for a lid, and I suspect it's a, it's a pictus or a container of some sort instead. It's like a set, I presume it's from a dining set. The material remains to be clarified, but Kevin Haber does a look at it from pictures, and he suspects it's Egyptian basalt, with another connection in to the far end of the Mediterranean. Parallels are hard to come by, but if you think of the arcading, we find that occasionally in hard stone vessels, look at the rock crystal here on Provenance in the centre, we find it more often on glass. And it's been argued, for example, by Michael Vickers, that glass is very much copying um, hard stone decoration, particularly crystal. The faceting on the left here from Colchester, or on the right, this wonderful vessel from a Germanic burial at Sakra in, in modern day Poland, which is purple. And that must surely be copying a stone vessel. Because these hard stone vessels were the spectacular end of the luxury goods market. I'm not saying our um, Castle Cary example was anything like as spectacular as this. Um, this is actually a Byzantine, 10th century Byzantine vessel today in the National Museum collections. Please excuse that gaudy, horrendous post-medieval gold mount that it's sitting on. But the original vessel is quite nice. They won't let me lever it out of it for some reason. These were real rare elite items. Now, the Castle Cary material is not in the same end of the spectrum, but it's sitting in the same spectrum. High quality imported material for the table. This is really useful because it perhaps recalibrates some of our views of what's happening in the frontier. We're used to more prosaic everyday items coming in as imports, the neither mended querns, the Kimberley shale armlets, and so on. And certainly in the northern frontier, material like marble is rare. We only have three examples. Um, here you see two of them, a statuette from Leader Water and the wonderful head from Hawkshaw. But the marble and this imported stone shows the presence on the frontier of the kind of people 
the disposable wealth and also the desire to bring Mediterranean luxury with on their boat. So that's given you, I hope, two tales of the unexpected. Castle Cary, fragments from a flash dining set in the commanding officer's residence. And with Camelin, an insight into a well-prepared member of Rome's elite who never left the frontier they came to on a tour of duty. It ties us into empire-wide networks and it's been on quite a journey this army, from Egypt to Rome to the frontier. Buried for eternity, disturbed by the railway, lauded and then dismissed. Forgotten for a hundred years and now brought back to life. And I'm really pleased that as part of our COVID recovery displays, we've been able to get it back on display in a short term show up until the end of March. If any of you are in or near Edinburgh before the end of March and can get a ticket, please do come along and come and see us. Thank you very much.